It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. We'll look at last week's patch Tuesday. Believe it or not, the third highest number of vulnerabilities last Tuesday, only topped by March and April. What's going on with Windows? Steve will talk about it. And then a deep dive into the technology of Wi-Fi 6 and why it might be worth waiting for Wi-Fi 6E. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Security Now comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 767, recorded Tuesday, May 19th, 2020, Wi-Fi 6. This episode of Security Now is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. Their advanced technology center is like no other testing and research lab, a proving grounds that can quickly turn a data sheet into a fact sheet where you can try before you buy. Better yet, you access it virtually so you and your team can have access 24-7. Visit WWT.com slash twit to learn more and get insights into all the Advanced Technology Center has to offer. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson. He's over there. <laughs> now he's there. He's there. Actually, I, I'm over here, Leo. What I'm people don't here. know is they see you there, but I see you there, 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 there. I have seven or eight Steves <laughs> around me at all times, many screens. Uh, it's more than you need. More, <laughs> plenty of Steve. Hi, Steve. Good to see you. Good Ep to be back. Episode 767. We're yep. flying into the future. Yep, um, and we are, as we will see, a few days, I think three days shy of a major anniversary. Oh. The 47th anniversary of the invention of Ethernet. Oh, Bob Metcalf. Uh, yes. Um, I want to talk about Wi-Fi 6, not for any particular reason, except that there was no like outstanding news of the week. And uh, I just sort of thought, okay, I've had it on my list of things to kind of get to because this whole, you know, 803.11 A, B, G, N, A, C, <laughs> all of this. Is, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It's just a mess. Yeah. And so I, I thought let's, let's sort of do a, take a walk through history, looking at where this started and look at the major milestones as we've gone along to look awesome. at the, the evolution of this. Um, wrapping up with, uh, well, some interesting recommendation because just last month, the FCC approved another chunk. Actually, it's a 1200 megahertz uh, bandwidth chunk up at the six gigahertz uh, band, separate from 2.4 and 5, which is what Wi Fi now uses. Um, which, you know, the industry is going to immediately jump on because it represents, you know, next. And so the question is, uh, do you, do you or if you were about to go to six, what are the, you know, things to consider about that? And maybe it makes sense to wait till uh -huh. you get a, 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 ba a base station, an access point that uh, is able to take advantage of the next stuff. So anyway, uh, we're going to, finish with that. But we've got, as we often do, on the third Tuesday of every month, take a look at the previous week's Patch Tuesday. And in this case, eh, maybe a worrying new trend which is emerging. Uh, we're also going to take a look at the DOH support coming soon to a Windows 10 near you hmm. uh, that is natively in the OS wow. itself. So not just the browser, but everything. Um also, a little-known packet capture utility that was quietly slipped in to Windows 10 back with the October 2018 feature update, 
which uh, will, I will talk about how you can use it to verify what type of DNS your Windows 10 system is using after you configure it to use DOH, see if it actually is. We're going to spend a bit of time on yesterday's uh, DOJ FBI press conference where oh, they're good. moaning more yeah. about Apple. Yeah. Um, uh, and also take a look at a problem that at Microsoft appears to be having a surprising time resolving and as I was researching this, I kind of got this, well, I wouldn't put it as, I don't know, it wasn't a sinking feeling, but it's like, okay, this is, this doesn't seem to be Microsoft up to their usual game. Um, also, we've got, uh, I, I got a kick out of this, face masks are thwarting automated public facial recognition in the UK. Good. Oh, boo-hoo. Uh -huh. <laughs> and Utah's decision to roll their own contact tracing and locating app. Uh, we're going to take a look at it uh -oh. and uh -oh. why I end up thinking, ah, you know, if it were available in California, oh, I really? think I would probably step up and do okay. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we'll wind up. Talking about, uh, I have a little brief update on Spinrite, of course, because I'm working on that full time now. Uh, and then we're going to start from uh, Bob Metcalf on. Wow. From Bob, you're going you're to skip Token Ring, I hope. And we'll yes. Just go <laughs> we'll we're go not doing <laughs> Token Ring. <laughs> uh, actually, um, rele rele relevant to that Utah story uh, any minute now, maybe not today, but I think it'll be today. We'll get the uh, next generation of iOS that will include that new API uh, for that kind of uh, contact tracing. So that'll, that should be uh, kind of interesting. But oh, and Leo, I forgot to mention, we have the painful pun picture <laughs> of the week. I'm looking at for it our right listeners, for, for actually for our viewers. <laughs> but anyway, our listeners will get it. So. Our show today brought to you by Worldwide Technology. The last trip, uh, not I'll ever take, but the last trip before this <laughs> shelter in place. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, now in hindsight, I think we probably took a big chance going to St. Louis on March 2nd. But it was well worth it because I wanted to see the Advanced Technology Center. And Steve, you would have loved this thing. They've been building it for more than 10 years now. Worldwide Technology is a great partner for a business, for enterprise, whether it's hardware or software. And, of course, one of the things that really helps them do a good job for their clients is this Advanced Technology Center. It started in one building and it's grown. I think it's three or four buildings now. Half a billion dollars worth of equipment half a billion dollars from some of the biggest OEMs in the business, uh, key partners ranging from high-tech heavyweights like F5, Red Hat, Cisco, and, and the little guys too, emerging disruptors like Equinix. It is, it is truly amazing. It, it came from a, the need for the, the, the customers expressed to Worldwide Tech that they needed to be able to make informed decisions and they needed to be able to do it faster. So Worldwide Tech's engineers use the Advanced Technology Center with and pretty much everything that you could buy in it to spin up proofs of concept, to test, to do compatibility checking, to do training, to help their customers understand the new technology before they install it. It really is a high-value tool in the product lifecycle. They use it to educate, to evaluate, and to innovate at, uh, at, a, at a rapid pace. And nowadays, business has to move at a pretty darn rapid pace. Uh, it's, there is no other testing research lab like it in the world. WWT is a trusted partner that focuses on business outcomes and stands beside their customer every step of the way. That's why most customers have been with WWT for a decade or more. They know that's where they can go to get the answers they need to make the most informed, the best decision backed by testing and experience. It's really, uh, this Advanced Technology Center is really a, a, an incubator for uh, innovation. Their on-demand F5 plus Red Hat Open Shift Lab, so cool. I mean, where else can you get hands-on access with step-by-step -step instruction on emerging IT architectures and technologies around really critical topics like Kubernetes, infrastructure automation with Ansible, um, application security with F5 Advanced Web Application Firewall, it's incredible. If you're interested in DevOps or learning about uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, CICD, WWT also has an on-demand lab and the expertise to help you there. I mean, honestly, you couldn't come up with something 
that WWT can't say, oh, yeah, we've got that. Come over here. Let's show you. We can help you implement it. This is a fantastic investment. Half a billion dollars worth of gear WWT has made in their customers to ensure their customers' success. One of the best things they did, they started this last summer, is they offer Lab as a service. They launched this, this new digital platform encompassing the entire ATC ecosystem, which means you can get in there yourself and do testing. And you don't have, you don't have to come to St. Louis to do it. It's open 24-7. You can perform all the programmatic testing you want using all this vast ecosystem, and it's virtual. I mean, it's brilliant. The key here is this ecosystem really creates a multiplier effect of knowledge and speed and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. So, and by the way, it's not just the hands-on labs. You also get access to articles and to case studies and all the tools you need to really understand the technologies that are out there and what they can do to help you and how, and how you can integrate them into your existing operation. So I want you to take advantage of Worldwide Technologies, Advanced Technology Center. Get the insights you need into the newest technologies right now. Just go to www.t.com slash twit. Worldwide Technology simplifies the complex. www.t.com slash twit. WWT delivering digital outcomes and modernizing IT infrastructures. And they do it from the coolest the coolest lab in the whole wide world. Thank you, WWT. It was a fun visit. I can't wait to go back out there. And now we go back to Steve Arino and, so, uh, and your picture of the week. Uh, so this was Photoshopped, but it was pretty clever. Uh, See if people so this get the shows a, See if they get the a random. It shows a guy wearing a, a white mask. Uh, and, of course, on the front of it, well, not of course, but in, in this particular mask, the front of it is has stenciled 255.255.255.0. So, of course, that makes it a subnet mask. Oh! 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And a very restrictive one, I might add. Uh, okay, well, a class C <laughs> subnet class C. mask. Yes, yeah. you really probably did when you think about it. You want a class A oh, subnet yeah. that's mask. That's what we're going for. If you're going to be, you know, yeah. trusting your health to it. So, of <laughs> course, uh, this guy did what he you know, got the best he could, I guess. Yeah, it's an I, this is just um, IPv4. I mean, no big deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, last Tuesday's patching round was not the biggest ever, but it was the third largest in Microsoft's history, weighing what? in with a whopping 111 CVE tracked bug fixes. They did 113 Six. last month. This is crazy. Uh, yes, Leo, and 115 the month before. Wow. 16 of this we of this month's 111 were rated critical. And all but one enabled remote code execution by an attacker. Um, in, a, in a refreshing change of pace, however, none were zero-day flaws. We've been having those recently, not this month. But think about this. Um, if things have been seeming worse recently, and they have been, it turns out it's not our imagination. Because as you noted, 115 bugs were fixed in March, making it the number one largest number of bugs in Microsoft's history – and 113 the month after in April, that is last month, with 111 this month. Crikey. So the past three months, March, April, and May, were the first, second, and third most patched bugs in Microsoft's entire history. And although this month's bugs span 12 different Microsoft products, from Edge to Windows and Visual Studio to .NET, nearly half were problems within Windows itself. So it's a big code base. How big are these bugs? I mean, are they just little, you know, little errors? Well, or? and that's really, that's that's a perfect question. So, you know, I'm glad that these oversights were being fixed. And I'm glad that whatever it is that is wrong doesn't appear to be affecting my own work when I'm using Windows 10. Because I do, that's, I sit in front of a Windows 10 every evening. That's what I have in my location with Lori. So... So perhaps these are all just exploitable edge cases. Uh, and since I was wondering exactly that, I took the time to read 
each and every one of this month's 111 descriptions. Yes, dear podcast listener, I did that for you. How painful. (laughs) I made a note of what it was that was wrong and was fixed. Every one of the 111 problems was exactly one of the following. Remote code execution vulnerability. Not good. Denial of service vulnerability. Not good. Elevation of privilege vulnerability. (laughs) Very not good. Cross-site scripting vulnerability. Terrible. <laughs> memory corruption vulnerability. Oh, my God. They're all A bad. spoofing vulnerability oh. or, not, you know, an information disclosure vulnerability. They're all terrible. Well, they're all bad, but among those 111 problems, there was not a single one that was not a vulnerability. So this suggests that it's not that Windows 10 is not working. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there are problems with uh, that, like we've seen with upgrades, like having to be backed out of and people, things going wrong because of some screwy AV system they've got or something. Um, and as we know, for the most part, it works. Um, and I'm sure that most of all, most of us listening to this podcast, although we had a bunch of, you know, thinking about the crowd that we had in Boston, Leo, uh, you know, sort of a representative demographic of the podcast, you know, there was a range of ages. There were, you know, young bucks and old timers, but those old timers among us certainly recall those days using the early versions of windows when it would just lock up at any time without any apparent cause, uh, and always without warning. Um, Some of the losses that resulted were so traumatic that to this day, today, I'm not kidding you, decades later, I'm still hitting control S (laughs) for save. That's right. Yes. You know, before I ever switch away Mm -hmm. from anything I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Because like habitually not, every minute, I, I'm still <laughs> yeah. not willing to trust that I'm going to be able to come back. But you're right; you know, those things don't happen as often. The the hard crashes, the data loss. Oh, it! I, I would say I, I'm I'm spend most of my time in front of Windows Seven. What I what I'm noticing is that the video does driver crashes. Yeah. Um, and so, but it like it's like everything freezes for a minute, and I go, okay, what's this? And then everything goes blank. And then it kind of comes back. Well, yeah. it didn't used to have, it couldn't used to do that. I mean, if the video driver crashed, it was, you know, right. blue screen, you know. Now it's like, ooh, ow, uh, hold on a second. And then it like well, they've, reconstitutes itself. They re-architected with NT and they really do protect Ring Zero much better than they used to. It's a lot yeah. harder to bring the system down. The one thing we still have today, I would argue that my control, my incessant control essing is probably, you know, from a rational standpoint, it's really not that necessary. But control C, the thing we have now is that that doesn't always take. And so I've noticed that if I want to make sure that I copy something to the clipboard, now I'm hitting control C a bunch of times. Just, you know, because one doesn't seem to be enough to make to give Windows the idea that, yo, no, he's serious. He really does want this on the clipboard. It's like, okay, fine. But anyway, uh, in the case of the myriad vulnerabilities that we've seen, certainly in this past month, we had, you know, uh, uh, I guess I'm feeling like Windows 10 works, um, but you really... As you were saying, as, as you know, like you know, uh, noting the nature of these vulnerabilities, you really don't want to expose it to too much incoming, because um, <laughs> that's not going to have a happy ending. No. So, what do you, th- you, know, do you think? It- it's because uh, there are more security people trying to find these bugs than ever before. That must be some of it. I do think so. And Leo, they just, they, Microsoft, will not leave it the F alone. Well, that's true, too. Just yeah. stop effing with Windows. <laughs> you know, let it sit, let it settle. Let it stabilize. But they're you always know, adding it, stuff. They can't oh. leave it alone. And and that also speaks to the poor quality of the code base because everything's inter, inter, interdependent. So you change something here and suddenly your wallpaper can't resize or something bizarre, right? <laughs> 
exactly. Yeah. Something, some obscure, yeah. like, okay, I can't set dark blue anymore. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. That stuff should not be interdependent. It oh. really shouldn't. But, and I, I did have a, a really, really good friend who got his, his comp sci degree from MIT. He was at Berkeley for a while, and he, and, and he went to Microsoft, and as he was leaving, he said, oh, <laughs> this, this is going to blow. Oh. It's, you know, it's going to blow. Oh, there's patch upon patch, patch upon patch upon patch. Oh, boy. Yeah, so you know, get somebody to filter your email externally if possible. Uh, use a well curated web browser. Uh, if you're going to go to anywhere sketchy on the internet, do that in a VM. VMs are easy now; they're free. We've been talking about you know the various VM solutions. Uh, pass anything that you download while you're in the VM through virus total before you even consider moving it out of the VM and then revert any changes that you made to the VM while you were using it. Sure. Uh, Uncle I mean, Joe's going to do that. Completely <laughs> that's not completely necessary. But in, in the past three months, just the past 90 days, 339 vulnerabilities incredible. have been patched. Yeah. And a number of them were in being exploited at the time that they got fixed. So, eh, you know, as I said, it works, but you just don't want to subject to too much subject it to too much incoming because, yeah, not good. I mean, if you if, do you think if you wrote something from scratch, it's just such a hairball of a oh, Leo, thing. there is no one on earth who now understands it, and that's a problem. That's a problem. You know, at yeah. least we have Linus or Linus, you know, who still is like sitting on top of and incubating Linux, mm -hmm. the, the Linux kernel. But there's nobody. This thing is out of anyone's ability to comprehend. And that's, of course, that's part of the problem. We were talking recently about how, how there is a problem with when a big, we have a big project, you're inherently needing to rely on other people's code. Other, you're, you're, you're grabbing libraries for this and that, Node.js uh, here and, and you know, some other module there in order to glue together a, a solution. Well, so what that means is that, you know, you're, you don't understand, you didn't write all that, you don't understand it all, you're assuming, hoping that these various pieces each behave themselves. That's Windows now because, you know, just once upon a time, we talked about this. I, you know, I still shed a tear when I actually knew what my files were. We have computers now. We just sort of scroll through the endless system 32 and the X by X, whatever that is. It's now like 25 gigs of stuff, something. And it's just like, okay, I've just, I just give up. I'm, I don't, I don't know what any of this is. I uh, just please don't have it hurt me. I think Microsoft. some of this is a legacy of uh, there was a period about 20 years where we were infatuated with some there were some very bad fads in coding uh, like object oriented coding. And I think we were infatuated with this stuff. And I think, you know, C++ there was there. I think some of this is the legacy of some just bad technologies well, that are going away now, and, frankly. And frankly, I mean, to Microsoft's credit, legacy is their middle name. Right. Um, you can't but dump it. once upon a time, they were getting a graphical user interface to run in a system right. with 640K. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so that's where the DLL was born, that crime against civilization – came from the fact that you had no choice back then to share code. So the idea was that you'd only have, you'd have these blocks of code that that apps would basically, they, an app was just a, a script that was calling functions in external dynamically linked libraries. And there was only one instance of this DLL in RAM so that it wasn't taking up space. Right, right. You know, to their credit, they got an amazing system to function in a zero resource environment. The problem is then 
the DL like they couldn't leave like okay that was version one of the DLL oh but we're going to add a few more things and make it version two but it's we're not but then it, of course it broke compatibility with version one so then the the then you remember the how you would install some new program and your old, things that were already installed stopped working so. That happened because of <laughs> DLL the colliding all with, the with time. The yeah, <laughs> all the time. I got calls so often on the radio show, and it, you know the answer would be, "Oh, you installed the DVD burning software that DLL clobber the DLL that your word <laughs> processor was using, and so that's why you can no longer get email." And it was like, oh, so frustrating. You know, at least we left IRQs behind. Oh, yeah, I, know. I mean, no, yeah, that yeah. half of your career, Leo, <laughs> was IRQ conflicts. <laughs> no, no kidding. It really was. <laughs> it's so depressing. Uh, uh, I think it's getting yeah. better. I really do. And uh, well, yeah. No, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I never. I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm not on the bleeding edge of anything, but uh, my systems never lock up or crash. They just go, you know, sometimes they get wounded, but they seem to heal themselves. It's like, oh, OK, well, that was good. Yeah, that's a little bit of magic. Yeah. So, yeah, I just um, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah, they are. They are huge lumbering machines. They are. So, um, OK, speaking of Windows 10 here, I'm like I'm complaining that Microsoft doesn't leave it alone. And then the next thing I talk about, this happened now several, several, several podcasts. It's like, oh, listen to this new feature that when <laughs> Windows 10 is getting. You see, you see, you see. Okay. Stop it. Um, OK, so they do it for DOH, you, Steve. <laughs> which is to say DNS over HTTP test drive is appearing for Windows Insiders. That's really interesting. Um, That's surprising. Yeah. I know. And I, that they really jumped on this quickly uh, without indicating when they would be giving this a wider release. Microsoft is letting Windows Insiders test drive DNS over HTTPS in the Insider Preview Build 19628. So you need to be on the fast ring. You need to be all on the jiffy spiffy quick last night's build. Hold your breath and, <laughs> you know, boot. Uh, but it, but the key number is 19628 and subsequent. Last Wednesday, Microsoft wrote, if you've been waiting to try DNS over HTTPS, do, on Windows 10, you're in luck. Luck was actually not involved, but fine. The first testable version is now available, they wrote last Wednesday, to Windows insiders. If you haven't <laughs> haven't been waiting for it and are wondering what DO is all about, then be aware this feature will change how your device connects to the Internet and is in an early testing stage, so only proceed if you're sure you're ready. On the other hand, it doesn't do anything to you. You've got to go ask for it. Um, so Microsoft first indicated their intent and their interest when we, we talked about this last November. Um, and as opposed to our browsers that are only offering this for browsing, this is at the deal at, this is at the OS level. So all browsers without any configuration, uh, everything else you do, email, uh, any other utilities that are doing DNS lookup, they all get protected. So this will be native for all of Windows DNS queries. Um, and where DNS is, of course, ubiquitously available from every ISP over the UDP protocol to port 53, DOH is not yet universal. So the first question anyone has is, what DOH provider does Microsoft use? Um, now, I, I went digging because I was curious about this. Turns out there is a proposal in the works for adding a DOH type to DHCP. So just as our systems today are able to auto-configure to our provider's old school traditional DNS, when a DOH type becomes supported 
by ISPs and routers and and um, and and PCs, then the same kind of auto configuration can occur when an ISP chooses to support DOH with their own server. But until that time, it's up to the user to decide which external DOH provider to use. And in Microsoft's case, three providers are currently supported to be used as DOH resolvers, Cloudflare, Google, and Quad9. The way this works is kind of clever. Windows needs to be configured to use one of these as a DNS server sort of through the normal DNS settings. Um, it is, DOH is disabled by default in this preview build. Um, you need to do some, believe it or not, registry tweaking. This doesn't surface at the UI at all. I've got the, the notes in the, the, the specifics in the show notes. You go to, for those propeller heads among us, H, H key local machine, system current control set, services. Under that is DNS cache. And under there is parameters. So in the parameters key under the DNS cache key under services, you create a new D word named enable auto DOH and set its value to two for some reason. I don't know what one does, but two is what we're told to do. This enables DOH. And so as long as you have your Windows machine configured to use Cloudflare's normal DNS or Google's normal DNS or Quad 9's normal DNS, when Windows is restarted, rather than sending normal DNS to one of those three providers, it sends DOH DNS, DNS over HTTPS. So it's kind of clever. I liked how, you know, you are at the, at the UI level, you just say, okay, I want to use Cloudflare's DNS, Google's DNS, Quad 9's DNS. And then if you also have it set to enable auto DOH, when Windows realizes that it's about to make a DNS query to one of those three, it goes, oh, and instead establishes and probably does it persistently because you want that uh, in order to make, you know, to, to be processing many DNS uh, DOH lookups uh, per second, uh, it establishes an HTTPS connection to that provider, and then that's its tunnel through which the entire OS then resolves its DNS queries. Oh, and if you want to set up a DOH server that isn't already on what Microsoft calls their, their so-called auto-promotion list, meaning that those are the DNS queries to an IP that are auto promoted to DOH uh, because, for example, maybe your corporate intranet supports it, although it's really arguably not a big need for DOH over a corporate intranet because it's, you know, really only when it goes outside of your control. Uh, or if your ISP started to support DOH and you wanted to use it just because it's sort of in the spirit of not aggregating all DNS down to a very few providers. Uh, you can do that. There is a, a command line uh, that uh, those who have messed with a command line are familiar with net sh. So you say net sh, and again, in the show notes, the details, space DNS, space add, space encryption, space server equals, and then your the, the IP address that you want Windows to notice and then convert from DNS to DOH, and then the so-called DOH template. So you do D I IP address space DOH template equals, and then that server's URL template. They call it the DOH URI template. And that's, you know, all of the DOH servers have it. It's HTTPS colon backslash backslash, you know, who knows what it is, like doh.cloudflare.com or whatever. I just made that up. That's not what it actually is for Cloudflare. Um, and so that's the HTTPS URL, which is to which a, a persistent connection is made to then establish the tunnel. And you can type something similar to, in order to, to like, in order to query whether the DIP address got registered, 
NetSH DNS show encryption server equals and then the IP address you're querying and it'll let you know if you've if if it has registered that IP in its auto promotion list. So anyway, I, I'm uh, delighted that Windows jumped on this as quickly as they did, uh, or that Microsoft jumped on this for Windows 10 as quickly as they did. Uh, it just, you know, makes it a no-brainer. You don't have to worry about, I mean, I guess our browsers are going to begin doing it, so they'll be establishing their own tunnels, ignoring what Windows is doing, but at least then that means that the rest of what Windows is doing uh, will also be DOH to the provider of your choice based on how you've configured Windows or even to your own local ISP uh, at such point as they start supporting it. So how do you know it's working? The standard answer would be to use some sort of network sniffer Microsoft has a network monitor that you can download separately, or of course the perennial favorite is Wireshark, which continues to evolve and move forward. But an intriguing option is to use Windows 10, little known, built in, and completely undocumented packet monitor, which is, which is PKTMON. If, you've, if you're in front of a Windows 10 machine, open a command line <clears throat> or a, uh, uh, you know, any form of command prompt and type PKTMON enter and you will be treated with a little help screen showing you the list of available verbs to follow PKTMON with and you can add help to the end of any of those and get help on those and basically explore this the command tree of a built-in packet monitor um, it was quietly added with zero fanfare as i noted back in the october 2018 windows 10 feature update um, and with this month's forthcoming windows 10 2004 boy, is that a confusing number, feature update, uh, it will be gaining a little bit more capability. Right now, it can run counters, which you can then examine, or it can log packets to a log file, which can, uh, can have its format converted. Um, th with Windows 10 2004 feature update, you'll be able to have it dump its captures directly to the screen, which will be very cool. It'll just give you a very quick, real-time display of stuff happening. So, for example, if you were to start, say that you wanted to find out whether, in fact, you were, your system was still issuing any old-school UDP, you might start by saying PKMON space filter space remove to clear any old filters that you might have around, then you'd say PKTMON space filter space add space hyphen T space UDP, saying that I only want, I want to capture the UDP transport, and then space hyphen P space 53 for port 53, which we know is DNS. So that would tell, that would establish, that would add a filter to capture all traditional DNS over UDP queries. Then you say PKT mon space start, which will initiate the filter and begin running counters, which will be incremented for any packets that match the filters. Um, if you wanted to, you could do PKT mon space start space hyphen hyphen ETW which will tell it to start the filtering and capture packets into a pktmon.etw file. And there are other parameters for all these things. So you could like give it, a, give it a different file name if you wanted. So what I did last night when I was playing with this was that I then had my browser, I poked around, I went to like a NY Times page thinking, okay, that's going to be full of DNS queries. You know, <laughs> is it going to be pulling crap from... 200 different domains. Uh, and then I came back to the command window and said PKT mon space stop. And I got a dump. I have it in the show notes for anyone who's curious. Um, a dump of all of the 
all of the capture events which occurred for UDP port 53 during the period of time that uh, that things were running. So it's just very cool. Uh, it shows you the the you know like all, all of the different stages of drivers in your in your various stack. You can type PKT mon space comp space list to list all the registered components in your system's network driver stack, uh, which is like amazing. There's a, just a bunch of stuff there. Um, but anyway, it's a terrific little built-in tool. You don't need to add anything else to your Windows 10 system. Everybody's got it since uh, uh, the October 2018 update. Um, and it can uh, quickly let you know uh, if you just like for any kind of purpose, like what your network is doing, um, if it captures your imagination, Bleeping Computers' Lawrence Abrams has reverse engineered a few additional tips and tricks. As I said, <laughs> there's no documentation anywhere. Microsoft did refer to it in their uh, DOH article, which is probably what put both Lawrence and me onto it. Uh, Lawrence took the time to like go down every command path. And anyway, he did find out a, a bunch of additional things. So uh, anyway, just a little hidden gem in, uh, in Windows 10. Very cool built-in utility. Because, you know, again, uh, um, you could install Wireshark and, and go that route. But, you know, this is already there. <sighs> so... The DOJ and the FBI, during a press conference yesterday, criticized Apple yet again over encryption. And boy, this was sort of, it was a weird comment that I'll, I'll highlight uh, here. Uh, I just didn't want to, I mean, you know, we know what it's about. I just didn't want to fail to touch on the fact that William Barr, who of course is the current head of the U.S. Department of Justice, announced, and I thought this was interesting, that FBI technicians had finally, after four months and, quote, much expenditure of taxpayer dollars, unquote, managed to crack and gain access to the two locked iPhones belonging to last December 6 Pensacola Naval Air Base shooter Mohammed Saeed uh, al-Shamrani. During the press conference, FBI's director Christopher Wray criticized Apple for not helping its investigators to unlock the two phones. Wray said the entire process of cracking the terrorists' two iPhones took four months and, quote, large sums of taxpayer dollars. So they were they were both harping on this. Now, since, Where'd that money go, do you think? <laughs> uh, exactly, Leo. Since actual cracking itself doesn't cost anything more than the time and skill, uh, either the FBI techs were extremely well paid during this arduous past four months, or more likely, the FBI went outside to purchase the golden keys for those two iPhones. And remember that one of the two phones had been shot by Al Shamrani. I was amazed when we first talked about this that, like, they were they were able to get it going he again. It's like must have missed. you could shoot an iPhone <laughs> and it still lights up. You missed the That's memory. Amazing. <laughs> oh. In any event, the DOJ said that following the FBI's success, they were able to link Al Shamrani to an Al-Qaeda branch active in the Arabian Peninsula, which I guess is no surprise because, you know, th those were his people. William Barr said, we now have a clearer understanding of Al-Shamrani's associations and activities in the years, months, and days leading up to the attack. And I should clarify that this guy was sort of like in a, like a, on base for some training yeah, he was know, a Saudi in the national, US. right, on, to be yes. trained. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> anyway, however, FBI Director Ray said that the investigation could have advanced sooner if Apple had helped 
the FBI's technicians. Ray said that despite public pleas from both President Trump and Attorney General Barr, Apple did not cooperate in the investigation. But then, in an immediate contradiction, Christopher Ray continued, quote, Apple made a business and marketing decision to design its phones in such a way that only the user can unlock the contents Shocking. no matter the circumstances. Shocking. <laughs> Apple's desire to provide privacy for its customers oh. is understandable, but not at all costs. <laughs> so first he's complaining that Apple refused to cooperate with this specific case despite pleas from top administration officials. And with the next breath, breath, he's complaining that Apple chose to design their phones in such a way that it was impossible for right. them to comply. Oh. Hmm. So I think we need to read this nonsense as the continuing drumbeat yeah. toward the inevitable collision of consumer encryption technology and legislation, which will somehow criminalize the use or the sale probably, because I, I doubt you're going to blame the user, of subpoena-proof encryption. We, we might imagine that this could take the form, for example, of some spiffy penalty legislation where, for example, any manufacturer of a consumer electronics device produced for sale within the United States will have 30 days to comply with a lawfully issued subpoena to decrypt and provide all data contained within the device to law enforcement, after which a significant fine, who knows, perhaps some percentage of that company's <sighs> annual revenue would be so that it sort of auto scales to the size of the company, would be levied against the company for each additional day beyond the initial 30 days that the device's decrypted contents are not provided to law enforcement. I'm just making that up. And of course, that would be for devices sold, beginning to be sold after some certain date, so that companies had some opportunity to change the way they have decided to have their devices operate. Uh, I did like the EFF, <clears throat> who, as always, weighed in, noting that the very fact that the FBI was able to crack the iPhones to obtain all of its information argued against the need for any change to the existing status quo. So thank you, EFF, for always, <laughs> always being there. Mm. Oh, boy. So anyway, again... I mean, they just like they like they wanted to announce their victory and to also pound Apple over the head and and also, you know, drive another stake into the uh, the whole encryption debate. So when is a fix not a fix? All too often, Leo, it's when path traversal attacks are involved. Yes, we were just talking about this last week or I got a couple of weeks ago, you and I, about the original sin of hierarchical directory design. Oh, yeah. Dot, dot, with slash, its, dot, dot. Yes. Yeah. It's an, exactly. It's inherent back, dot, dot to, to refer to the parent directory, which allows you to traverse back up the hierarchy and then back down. And, and of course, you know, that's not itself as much of a problem. Well, except that then security constraints were placed on hierarchy with like cleverly, but still, ouch, as it turns out, on nodes in the hierarchy such that descendants of a security policy that exists at a branch in the in the branching directory hierarchy are then inherited by all of the the, the uh, objects downstream of the branch. So, you know, it's very powerful. You could argue it's very, very cool. Um, you know, and, you know, 
Windows inherited the same architecture. I mean, because it is very powerful, but oh my God, has it been a source of security problems. And, and as the saying goes, what could possibly go wrong? In this week's installment of what did actually go wrong, we learn that when Microsoft fixed their reverse RDP, you know, uh, a remote desktop protocol attack problem last July and then tried to do it again this past February, it was never really fixed, at least not for everyone. So backing up a bit, recall that last summer, several attacks against Microsoft's RDP protocol came to light. There was a serious authentication bypass against the server, which led to last summer's spate of attacks against vulnerable RDP servers. And also there was separately a path traversal vulnerability that could compromise an RDP client, which made the mistake of remotely connecting to a malicious RDP server. And I noted at the time that that one seemed significantly less worrisome since someone using RDP to access a server other than their own seemed eh, less likely. Um, so this all came to light after Microsoft patched the first patch, the vulnerability as part of its July 2019 Patch Tuesday update last summer. But later, it turned out that Microsoft only thought that they had resolved the problem. Researchers at Checkpoint were able to bypass that patch <laughs> simply by replacing the backward slashes in the paths with forward slashes. The researchers explained that the July patch can be bypassed because of a problem that lies in its path. And here's a word, uh, here's a, uh, 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 well, <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking on the word because it's canonicalization. Yes. A mouthful. A word mouthful. That's it's it. It's path, cannot, 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 <laughs> now I can't say it. Canon canonicalization. There you go. Yes. Path canonicalization. I think there should be a better it's, word than that. That's terrible. The, the well, people like them, you know, and we get, you know, yes. Well, so it's path. The actual API call is path CCH canonicalize, which is used to sanitize file paths. This allows the that is the failure for them to properly canonicalize paths <laughs> very well done <laughs> allows a malicious attacker to exploit the clipboard synchronization which exists between an RDP client and its server to allow the server to drop arbitrary files in arbitrary paths on the client machine thus the clipboard redirection feature while connected to a malicious compromised RDP server allows the server to use the shared RDP clipboard to send files to the client's computer to achieve remote code execution of any code that the server wants to shove down the client connection. And although the checkpoint researchers had originally confirmed and, and quoting them, quote, the fix matches our initial expectations, unquote, back when it appeared in July, it appears that didn't actually fix the problem. The patch can still be bypassed, as I mentioned, by replacing the backward slashes, you know, file backslash to backslash location in any paths with forward slashes, just turning them into leaning right slashes, which are, as we know, the path separators used in Unix-based systems. Um, the researchers explained, it seems that the path CCH canonicalize, the function that is mentioned in Windows best practice guide on how to canonicalize a hostile path, simply ignored the forward slash characters. Huh. They said, we verified, I know, Leo, it's just amazing. <laughs> we verified this behavior by reverse engineering Microsoft's implementation of the function 
seeing that it splits the path into parts by searching only for the backslash character and ignoring the forward slash character. After this was pointed out, Microsoft acknowledged the incomplete fix and repatched the flaw three months ago in its February 2020 Patch Tuesday update. But in the latest chapter of this ongoing saga, a Checkpoint researcher observed that Microsoft addressed the issue by adding a separate workaround in Windows while not actually repairing the underlying cause oh. of the bypass issue in the path CCH canonicalize function. The upshot of this is that while the workaround apparently works fine for the built-in RDP client in Windows operating systems, the patch will not protect and does not protect any third-party RDP clients, and there are many, against the same attack that relies upon the vulnerable path canonicalize sanitation function developed by Microsoft. Checkpoint wrote, quote, we found that not only can an attacker bypass Microsoft's patch, but they can bypass any canonicalization function check that was done according to Microsoft's best practices, which uses that API call. As a result, a remote malware infected server could take over any client that tries to connect to it. And as I was doing the research in this latest bit of annoyance, I had the sense, and I'm sure our listeners do, and I know you do, Leo, because I've heard you moaning, that someone was not really paying attention <laughs> over at Microsoft. You know, we heard last year, that they were really taking a much leaded long look at RDP and their other exposed server protocols. And that sounded like all good news, but the persistent incomplete solving in quotes <sighs> yeah. of this problem made me aware that as buggy, vulnerable and patch needy as windows has become, at least we've always had the sense that the developers at Microsoft were quite highly skilled. And frankly, they need to be to keep Windows moving in a more or less straight line. Uh, if that should ever change, Windows is done for. And you got to wonder mm -hmm. about someone just like not changing the act, not fixing the actual function. Just, just like... Pat, like they yeah. didn't read the whole memo. Or they were in a they hurry. Just wrote, or, yeah. re read the beginning of it. Ugh. It seems sloppy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and sloppy will be the death of Windows, Leo. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. If the only thing that they've got going for them is they've got highly skilled developers because they have built, I mean, th the term is a house of cards. And as long as you're placing each card very carefully – <laughs> onto the existing monstrosity, okay. But, you know, if someone comes along and doesn't appreciate the delicacy of this thing, yeah, boom. boom. So, it turns out, LFR is unfortunately abbreviation we're going to be needing to learn. It stands for Live Facial Recognition. Its initial trial program used in London has been controversial, with the biggest problem being, aside from just the creepy big brother aspect of being monitored and surveilled without your explicit consent, the biggest problem is that in the best of times, even before everyone was wearing COVID-19 masks or subnet masks, the system was causing more trouble than it was worth due to its ex highly, it, its extremely high pulse positive, pulse, false, <laughs> boy, I'm kidding, <laughs> false positive rates. I hate that would be pulse a positives. false positive rate. <laughs> yeah, I hate those. For any of you who have improperly canonicalized this <laughs> sentence, uh, coming in as high as 90% in two recent LFR live facial recognition deployments in which over 13,000 faces were scanned, six individuals 
were stopped as a result of a match, five of whom had been misidentified by the system. That's not good. That's not good. Civil rights groups say there is no clear legal basis for scanning the faces of potentially millions of citizens in the hope of catching a few people with fears that a wholesale rollout could contribute to a shift towards a surveillance state model adopted in countries such as China. This was all happening in London. Uh, And I can say, I mentioned this during our Thursday uh, uh, panel last week, that it was with a little bit of surprise, but then I, of course, realized that my own well-trained iPhone looks back at me with a great deal of puzzlement when I hold it up to my masked face. It's like, uh, no, you're going to have to do better than that yeah. or you, type in you? your you are? code by hand. <laughs> What's your subnet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as long as wearing face masks is considered polite, bad guys wishing to avoid any chance of automated recognition can appear to be acting with full social responsibility by wearing a mask when they're getting about some business, which is probably not socially responsible. Uh, and I guess it must come down to the question of whether people have, you know, as we know the term is, a reasonable expectation of privacy when they're out in public. And so those, you know, law enforcement argues that, well, if you're in public, you don't have an expectation of privacy. Although, Leo, what's the law with, like, taking pictures of people because sometimes we see people's faces blurred out when they're in public settings yeah, in order so, to clearly to protect their identity. So photographers are allowed to take people pictures of people in public without permission. <clears throat> but uh, it's I remember when we and I worked at NBC that they wanted releases of anybody that would be shown on camera on NBC regardless of where the location was. And they said, even if they're turned around, if your mother could recognize you, then we want to release. But that may have just been lawyers being overly proactive. And yeah. it is the case that, you know, responsible photographers, we always tell people, you know, ask permission to just go around shooting. But I don't think technically you you have to. A mall, that's not a public place. You know, um, you know, some sidewalks in front of buildings may not be public. But but a truly public place, yeah, you could take pictures. You have no. Oh, that's interesting. So there's a. T- I, I'm surprised that a mall would not be considered. Oh yeah, public. that's not. That's that's huh. privately owned. So you can be huh. kicked out of a mall. You can be kicked out of a lot of places. Train stations, airports. <laughs> I've been I don't, kicked I, out I, of I don't the best. want to know how you know that, Leo. <laughs> but uh, they don't. They really don't like you taking pictures. And you know, if you're taking pictures at a power plant from. The street oh. from a public area, you will get stopped, and uh, you know. I mean, t- you have a legal right, but on the, at the same time, I don't know how much you want to well, assert. Well, and, and and we know, for example, that there are blackout zones in certain areas of the globe where satellites are not allowed to be surveilling. Well, yeah. So, and I yeah, this only applies to the United States. Your yeah. your rules may vary. I think we're about at our midpoint, so let's take yeah. our second break. You know, I I, that's, I think one of the <laughs> inadvertent advantages of mask wearing that I'm kind of welcoming, <laughs> to be honest, to be perfectly yeah. honest with you. I want to yeah. make the, the fashion, and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it became kind of fashionable uh, just because people want to be private when they're walking around. The truth is, as you know, uh, we've, we've talked about it, there's lasers that can identify you from your heartbeat at 100 meters, your yep. Google can, with cameras using gate detection, identify you uniquely. So there are lots of ways to identify you that don't require an, you know, the ability to see your mouth and nose. Well, and don't steam up your glasses either. <laughs> That's the other problem with the face mask. A good face mask will seal at the top so that you don't, you don't mess up your, your, uh, nice. your eyewear. Yes. Uh, our show today, very happy to say, brought to you by these little guys right here. This is this here is a canary. It is what we started doing on this show many moons ago, a honeypot. Uh, although they've come a long way than, from those honey monkeys we were talking about in the early days <laughs> of security now. Uh, this canary is really an appliance. And you just, you can see it, you just plug it in 
to the wall and you plug it into the network. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if they have PoE canaries at this point, too. I have to ask. The idea is you configure it from the canary console to be whatever you want it to be. Canaries don't look vulnerable. They look valuable, and that's the key. Mine, this canary here, for instance, has been uh, configured as a Synology NAS for a long time. You can light them up like a Christmas tree with every service. I'm a little more judicious. I have a few you know, services running on there that a bad guy might want to attack. You, uh, It has the, a MAC address, an official Synology MAC address. You know, they just take the first chunk and you can say what the rest of it is. It has the actual Synology login. I mean, for an attacker, it looks exactly like it's a Synology. In any way that he might look at it, he's going to say that's a Synology sitting on the network. And you can name it. You can, uh, by the way, you can also create an unlimited number of what they call canary tokens, which are files, PDFs, Word documents, whatever kind of document you want, that also look valuable. We have scattered around our network some uh, PDFs that say employee payroll information, things like that, the kinds of things a hacker might be looking for. What happens when a hacker tries to open that file or tries to log into my NAS? I get an alert. And I don't get 100 alerts. I get an actionable alert. They roll them all up so I know exactly what's going on. We know that companies that are attacked often have hackers roaming the network for days, weeks, months, in some cases, Marriott, years. <laughs> years. Getting all the information, finding out who's who, downloading databases. You need to know if somebody's on your network, and the canary is a great way to find out. A honeypot that attracts attackers and lets you know the minute they're touched. You can have an email or a text message. You can have a, a, an alert on your console. There, You can use Slack. It supports webhooks. It has its own API. So it's very, or syslog. It's very easy to set it up to work exactly how you want to work. And it can look like anything from a Windows server to a SCADA device. You could have a Siemens centrifuge on your network. And uh, there are probably some companies that probably should pretend that they have a Siemens centrifuge on their network trying to attack the bad guys. Hackers take the last the, pa the path of least resistance. They're going to they're gonna get in there through your staff, through social engineering, through spear phishing, but the problem is, once they're in, it takes an average of 191 days. It's more than six months for a company to realize there's been a data breach. And I bet you that number is the companies that realized it. I bet you there's lots of companies out there that still don't even know that it's happening right now and they don't even know. The Canary looks like something that would normally be on your network, a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, a Windows server. Attackers cannot tell the difference. You can put fake files on them. You can enroll them in Active Directory. You can make it look exactly like it's something real. But what's great is the minute an attacker investigates further, they give themselves away. You're notified. You can act right away. The company that designed the Canary, Thinkst, has been in the security game for almost two decades. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks, and they take that information, all that they've learned, and to created the Thinkst Canaries. They're deployed all over the world, all seven continents. They're deployed by governments, by companies, by lots of people that you would imagine. There are lots of people you wouldn't know. And it's such a great deal. If you go to canary.tools slash twit as an example, and you can get as many as you need. Some companies have dozens, maybe hundreds. Some companies have just a handful. We have just the one. But uh, typically, you'll get maybe, say, five canaries. That's $7,500 a year. With that, you get your own hosted console, so you can configure the canaries remotely anytime in any way you want. You get automatic upgrades. You get support. You get maintenance. If anything happens to your canary, boom, they send you a new one. They plug it in, and it's ready to go. Right now, if you use our offer code TWIT, in the How Did You Hear About Us box at canary.tools slash twit, you'll get 10% off your canaries forever, for life. And we know you're going to love the things, Canary, but if, for any reason, you don't, you're not happy. You can return your canaries within two months for a full money-back guarantee, a full refund. Two months, that's a long time that they give you to, to try it out. You're going to love it. The best thing about the canary is you set it and forget it. In fact, if all goes well, you won't hear from it. But when you do, you'll and we did once, and you will be very glad 
that you got that alert. Let me tell you. Canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. This is a great product. A really wonderful company. And uh, I couldn't recommend it more highly. You really need something like this to protect yourself against those advanced persistent threats. Canary.tools slash twit. Steve Arino, back to you. It really does make a lot of sense, Leo. It does, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, we, we have porous borders. You just you need, need somebody Zero knowledge, to detect right? if someone's rummaging around That's on what your they network. call it, right? That's... Zero knowledge. You treat everybody as yeah. an intruder. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Utah has done what I expect lots of states to do. They have chosen to roll their own uh, COVID virus contact tracing app. Um, it, to me, it, it makes sense. Um, uh, they call it healthy together and it's on the app store, both, uh, iOS, uh, and in Google play. Does it, so it's, so available it doesn't, both. It's, it's available. Now. That means it doesn't use the API, the Google, uh, Apple API. Correct. It does not. They have their own. Uh, thing. It was created by a startup called Twenty Holdings, who's best known for their. Well, they're not they're not very well known. But if anyone knows them, I'm you know I'm sure their mother. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's Twenty Hangout with Friends. It's a social app which allows users, in their words, to quote, see who's around, see who's down, and hang out. Oh, unquote. Dear. Oh dear. So. The company already, I, I'm sure this is what happened. They already had a platform for enabling physical right, right. in-person connections. Uh, so they thought, hey, we already have a contact dating app. We can easily convert it into a contact tracing app. Sure. So their Healthy Together app uses everything it can get its hands on, including physical location data, including GPS, Wi-Fi access point proximity, cellular phone tower triangulation, and, and Bluetooth. Its goal is to pinpoint its, its opt-in users' locations and their location history um, and ID coronavirus breakouts and hotspots. And I've got to say, for those who are civic-minded and who do not mind the privacy implications of explicit historical tracking, since that's clearly what's going to be necessary for, for dealing with outbreaks, uh, that is, at the, at the state health services level, you know, they, they, they want more than just individual, you know, oops, I, was, I may have been near somebody who was positive, so... You know, am I really going to self-quarantine for 14 days? Um, you know, for me, I, I, I think this makes a lot of sense. There's nothing I'm doing in my life that's the least bit controversial. I mean, it's going to like see this boring loop bet between my two work locations at this point. And, you know, and my one tank of gas lasted, I think, two months last time I filled. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I personally would not hesitate to add that to my phone for the duration. Of course, you're free to delete it anytime you want it. You know, if I were to become infected and my location and time history could be played back to determine when and where that occurred and everyone else who was also present in the same group at the same time could then be interviewed and checked, that would prove to be Fine. a vital yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. For, for for health. And, you know, if, as it looks like, we are going to be reopening and people are not going to be practicing the kind of safety that they need to based on some of what, what we're seeing currently with, you know, the high density restaurants and no one wearing masks, then then I would argue that the, the responsible thing to do, the flip side of that is, OK, then opt into something like this so that so that your state can 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 zero in on outbreaks and proactively notify you that hey you know you were here at this time thank you for letting us know because now we're able to let you know you need to be very careful mm -hmm. uh like we'd love to have you come in and just 
you know, get swabbed to, to see whether you might not, you, you might have, uh, have the, uh, virus, but not, but be, be asymptomatic, assuming that you're not showing symptoms. The point is you really need something like this. They, they have a site. I've, it's coronavirus.utah.gov slash healthy hat slash, sorry, coronavirus.utah.gov slash healthy hyphen together hyphen app. And it, it's, it says uh, of the healthy together beta app, they say, protect yourself and your family. Utahans are working to slow the spread of COVID-19. We can work together to protect our family members, friends, health workers, and our communities. The Healthy Together app helps you assess your symptoms. Find the nearest testing center. Of course, that means they know where you are, nearest testing center. View test results and learn what to do after you've been tested for COVID-19. So they have four bullet points there up at the top. Assess your symptoms. Use the symptom checker to see if you need to be tested. Two, find the nearest COVID-19 testing center. Testing centers are located across the state. Three, learn what to do after you get tested. Get your test results and instructions for care. And four, location data. Find COVID-19 hotspots to focus public health efforts. And so they gave themselves a bit of a Q&A. Question, how does the Healthy Together beta app help protect me and my family and slow the spread of COVID-19? Their answer, the Healthy Together beta app helps you assess your symptoms, find the nearest testing center, view test results, and learn what to do after you've been tested for COVID-19. We can work together to slow the spread of COVID-19 and protect our family members, friends, health workers, and our communities. If authorized by the user, the app can also provide location data to public health workers, providing them with a faster and more accurate picture of where and how the virus is spreading within our community to focus public health efforts. Question, what happens to my data? Answer, protecting your data is of utmost concern to the state of Utah and the developer, 20. To ensure the privacy and security of the data, um, of the data will follow these will follow these principles and limitations. Using the app is strictly opt-in and voluntary. Your own you own your data and can delete it at any time. Only data required to combat COVID-19 will be shared with public health officials. Location data is automatically deleted after 30 days. Symptom data is automatically de-identified after 30 days. The developer will comply with state requirements for data security and encryption. You can decide what data you would like to share, for example, Bluetooth data, location data, or contact lists. Question, who has access to my data? Is the data shared with any third parties? What details are shared? Answer, your data is secure and you are in full control of what you choose to share. Only data that is useful to combat COVID-19 will be shared with public health officials. While the state will have access to your symptom data, location and Bluetooth data will only be released to the state should you test positive for COVID-19. Now, that's a little limiting in my opinion. Maybe you can share it otherwise because, you know, I'd like to be notified if I was in an area at a specific time when they believe the result of this demonstrates there was active virus, you know, in the air at that time or on, on contact surfaces. Anyway, question, which public health officials will have access? Utah has trained a team of contact tracers under the Utah Department of Health who will reach out to people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and have been potentially exposed to the disease. When you grant access to your location or GPS and Bluetooth data, members of this team will be able to access your data to help in the contact tracing process. The app will help these professionals identify transmission zones, contact patterns, and other vital information to inform their research. So vital epidemiological data. 
Finally, answer our question. Why aren't you using just Bluetooth like Apple and Google are or utilizing the API that Apple Google built? Their answer, Bluetooth on its own gives a less accurate picture. Actually, as we know, deliberately nothing but contact information. Less accurate, accurate picture than Bluetooth and GPS location data. The goal of Healthy Together is to allow public health officials to understand how the disease spreads through the vector of people and places. And both location and Bluetooth data are needed to accomplish that. Bluetooth helps us understand person-to-person -person transmission, while location GPS data helps us understand transmission zones. Having both of these important data points provides a more effective picture of how COVID-19 spreads. This data helps policymakers make the best possible decisions about how and where we begin to relax and modify restrictions as our community and economy begin to reactivate. And I say, hallelujah. Um, again, if, if there was something I could download for California, I would put it in my phone and turn it on and, and, and share my location data, which, as I said, is very, very not exciting. Um, but I would love to get a notification if, you know, if, if, you know, if after the fact I'm informed that where I was at the time I was, people were getting infected. To me, that would be useful and certainly worth the, the, the trade off. And again, it's not for life. It's not forever. All of that is self-expunging after 30 days, as it should be. That's correct design because nothing matters past that point. Um, I, I just think it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, as, uh, as everyone knows, I saluted the technology from a crypto standpoint of what Apple and Google did. That's what we analyzed. Bruce Schneier thinks all of this is nonsense. Uh, but, boy – you know, voluntary location tracking. I, I don't know, Leo, you've probably seen some of the news where already anonymized cell phone data has been used just to, like, watch people. There was one right. where the, the, the aggregate of people who were on a certain day in a meatpacking plant, their phones were anonymously followed as they just dispersed literally across the country. Mm -hmm. And it was just fascinating to see, you know, how valuable that kind of location data is, even if you don't know who it is. Right. No, we've seen a lot of that, actually. Uh, presumably yeah. anonymous, but still. Yeah. Yeah. Spinrite. Uh, work is continuing quite well on the project. Yesterday, before switching to work on this podcast, I posted my just completed full, from scratch, fat partitioning fat partition formatting code. Um, it's just a simple, I think it was, it was 8K before I signed it so that Windows would be happy and that exploded it to 18K. But, you know, okay. Uh, if, if people were saying, hey, Windows says this, it doesn't know who the publisher is. I was like, oh, I forgot to have, to, forgot to sign it. But anyway, uh, I need Spinrite's thumb drive boot installer to be able to work on any old or new thumb drive the user might have around, regardless of that drive's history, because uh, who knows what users will have. Spinrite's current installer, which I wrote back in 2004, and as I think I mentioned on the podcast last week, I, I was like I was shaking my head because there was code in there for doing this on Windows 95. Uh, anyway, it's showing its age and is in need of some rework. So I wrote a from scratch FAT12, 16, and 32 partition formatter uh, that will just take any thumb drive it is given. It'll remove what's there, install a master boot record. That's the next piece of work I will start on this evening uh, and then put a FAT, uh, FAT format partition of whatever size is necessary based on the size of the drive and then install uh, FreeDOS and the test code that we'll be using. Um, and that should be finished pretty. Sh uh, that'll be finished shortly. And at that point, everyone will be able, to, uh, who's testing, to more easily boot the testing code on their own machines. Um, and then 
the new AHCI driver code that I've talked about before, I'm still, there's a couple little cases I'll get back to some specific chipsets where it looks like it's, it's still, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, there was some chipset, I can't remember now, um, where it just wasn't supporting a couple bits in the spec. And I was expecting they all would. This one didn't. So I was like, okay, fine. I can work around that. So there will be a couple more things like that. Um, anyway, it's why I'm excited to put this code out as a really cool raw performance benchmark for all of this podcast listeners. Uh, everyone will be able to play with it. Uh, I'm sure that I, we will find additional systems where there are some problems. I want to find them because I want to fix them. So anyway, well, we'll be able to involve everyone here before long. At the moment, we're just working in the in the GRC spinright.dev news group. Okay. Uh, I titled this Wi-Fi 6, the, the podcast, because that's where we're going to end up. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to do a bit of historical framing to place Wi-Fi 6 into the context, the and historical context, since, as I mentioned, the 47th anniversary of the invention of Ethernet, not the Internet, of Ethernet, although they're pretty much <laughs> coincidental, as we'll see, uh, three days from now, uh, on, where is it, May 22nd, 1973. So uh, Ethernet was invented by a guy named Bob Metcalf. Nice guy. He and I were on a couple panels back in the day. Uh, uh, we've talked a lot on this podcast about packet switching. Bob is one of the people who built some of the very first hardware. In 1970, while I was rapidly falling in love with assembly language on a PDP-8, and Bill Gates was playing with a newly installed teletype at his high school, which was hooked to a remote time-sharing system, Bob Metcalf was building an interface known as the IMP, I-M-P, which stood for Interface Message Processor. It linked a PDP-10 at MIT to the ARPANET, as it was known at the time. Three years later, in 1973, after building a second IMP host interface at Xerox Park which is where Bob was, he was assigned the task of somehow extending the ARPANET into buildings full of Park's personal computers, which, of course, at the time was the only place in the world where it had occurred to anyone that computers might actually be personal. Um, it was on May 22nd of 1973, in three days, 47 years ago, that Bob wrote the memo inventing Ethernet. So today, 47 years downstream, more than 1.2 billion new Ethernet ports are shipped every year. One third of them are wired, two thirds of them are Wi-Fi. So let's follow the path that leads from there to today's Wi-Fi 6. Um, Bob's wired Ethernet first appeared commercially in 1980 and was standardized by the IEEE, that's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. It was called, I, it was standardized as IEEE 802.3. Uh, and of course, it would become a growing family of electrically connected Ethernet adapters over time. Three years later, in 83, we had 10 megabits per second with 10 base 5, which used a thick coax cable, not very easy to work with. In 85, two years later, the much more popular 10 base 2 uh, switched to a much more manageable thin coax. Um, that's the first one I used when I ran that, that horseshoe loop around the building. You had to do a a horse, you had to be, it was like a, a straight line. You had 
terminators on each end so that the signal that hit the end would not reflect back. It would just, it would absorb it smoothly. And then you, you, you put T adapters to sort of T connect into the thin cable wherever you had a PC. So we had a sort of a, 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 a facility early in GRC's day where a big U shape uh, allowed us to connect everyone's machines. And it was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, in 1990, we got 10 base T where the T stood for twisted. That was twisted pair, which initially ran at the same 10 megabits. Then five years later, we saw the jump to a hundred base T that brings us to 1995, which was that also known as fast ethernet because now 10 megabits was slow. Uh, that, of course, gave us a tenfold jump to 100 megabits per second. In 98, we got 1,000 base X, which was for one gigabit over fiber optic cabling. And uh, uh, the next year, engineers had figured out how to deliver the same speed over the much more convenient multiple twisted pairs, uh, giving us 1,000 base T. Um, in 97, when our 100 base T was then a couple years old, engineers began looking at wireless. Whereas the family of wired Ethernet were all 802.3, the IEEE assigned 802.11 for their work on taking the same time-proven Ethernet technology wireless. The very first 802.11 was mostly experimental. So this is, again, first wireless Ethernet. Uh, it was quickly followed up two years later in 99 by 802.11a, whereas the first 802.11 operated in the 2.4 gig band and was only able to deliver around 1 to 2 megabits per second, 802.11a moved into the 5 gigahertz band with a physical... That's sort of like a technical maximum bit rate in the air of 54 megabits per second. But it also relied upon a lot of forward error correction so that it ended up delivering an effective data rate eh, kind of down in the mid-20 megabits per second range. The 2.4 gigahertz band is occupied, was already and now to the point of being crowded with microwave ovens, Bluetooth, baby monitors, cordless telephones, some amateur radio equipment operates there. So moving 802.11a into the relatively unused 5 gigahertz band gave it a significant advantage. But the higher carrier radio frequency, 5 gigahertz versus 2.4, brings some trade-offs. Since a higher frequency means a shorter wavelength, and a shorter wavelength increases the signal's absorption by walls and other solid objects in their path. So, again, sort of a trade-off. And we'll, we'll see, we're moving, sort of jogging back and forth uh, between these two bands. As a consequence of the fact that 5 gigahertz was, you know, is okay, but causing some problems, the next move was to work to improve the data performance of the inherently more robust 2.4 gigahertz lower frequency band. That gave us 802.11b. Um, and products starting uh, 20 years ago, back in the year 2000, were based on 802.11b. It used a more advanced carrier modulation scheme to deliver a maximum effective bit rate of around 11 megabits per second. Uh, the products were inexpensive and plentiful, and Wi-Fi really began to take off because it was like, okay, now this thing works. And since 802.11a operated at 5 gigahertz and 802.11b operated at 2.4 gigahertz, it was feasible to create dual-band Wi-Fi known as 802.11b. A slash B or AB. Three years after that, uh, 802.11G delivered a third K 
carrier modulation standard for the lower band 2.4 gig. It managed to deliver the same 22 megabit second throughput of the much more finicky 5 gigahertz 802.11a while operating in the inherently longer range, though more congested, 2.4 gigahertz band. And as with 802.11ab, all three modes then were often combined to yield 802.11a, b, and g. So at this point, things have become a bit of a mess. Just, you know, evolution does that. So work was undertaken to pull all of the various amendments to the original 802.11 together to figure out what to do next. The result was that, uh, the result of that work emerged by the end of 2009, and that was 802.11n. Um, and even though, and we talked about this on the podcast at the time, because we were here then, the industry didn't actually wait for the publication of the formal standard. It jumped the gun by a couple years by following the first draft specification two years previous. Uh, there was just too much pent up need and everyone figured, well, okay, uh, we hope when 802.11n is formalized that we're still in, you know, like we're still certified or we will be able to get certified because right now uh, we're just hoping this, this is what it's going to be. Uh, 802.11n combined everything and it would later come to be retroactively labeled Wi-Fi 4 by the Wi-Fi Alliance. So this is, you know, their attempt to begin, you know, they recognized, okay, this is a alphabet soup of confusion for the typical consumer. Let's drop all of this 802.11abgdef and just say Wi-Fi 4. So that's what 802.11 later became named as retroactively. The other thing it introduced was the three antenna MIMO, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output system. Uh, and being that it pulled everything together, operates on both the 2.4 and the 5 gig bands. Although support for 5 gigahertz uh, technically is optional in the spec. Okay, seven years ago, in 2013, this 802.11n, also known now as Wi-Fi 4 standard, had its 5 gigahertz transmission channel bandwidth significantly widened from 40 megahertz to 80 or 160. The wider the band, the higher the data rate you're able to use in that band. You have more bandwidth. Um, and the encoding of the data jumped from, a, from 64 QAM, which is quadrature amplitude modulation, to 256 QAM. So it jumped from encoding six bits at a time to eight bits at a time. And since it's all just silicon, they also defined something known as multi-user MIMO, M-U-M-I-M-O, all of which results in where we went next, 802.11ac, which was also later retroactively labeled Wi-Fi 5. So it took, took 802.11n and widened the channel bandwidths and improved the modulation scheme to be able to store 8 bits uh, in a time interval where before they could only store six. Um, but we should pause our history here for a minute to talk about this. The original Ethernet used a system that is to talk about this Moo MIMO, the multi-user MIMO. The original Ethernet used a system which we talked about on this podcast years ago back in our earlier tutorial phase known as Carrier Sense Multiple Access with collision detection. That's what Bob invented back then. That, that was the essence of his genius. Um, it was essentially a party line. You know, and remember the old days, uh, I think this predates both of us, Leo, but in the, like the first telephones, you actually often had 
multiple subscriber lines, they were also known as, where you'd Party pick up lines. the phone. Party lines. Yeah, yeah, to see if anybody was, like, already using it. And if not, you would maybe, what, uh, flash the hook switch in order to get the attention of the operator and then have her connect you somewhere. And if you picked the phone up and there was already a conversation going on, politeness required that you not eavesdrop, but that you put the phone back down on its hook and Marge, then come back I later. I told her when I came in there that I really didn't like the way she was wearing her hair. And then, exactly. yeah, it was really awful. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm talking Bob here, Leo, get off the phone. <laughs> But I, well, I how much to... longer are you going to be? Yeah, You've been exactly. on for the last yeah. three hours. There's still yeah. plenty of rural areas where they don't have enough, you know, carriage capacity to have anything but a party line. Believe it or not, today still. I've heard from people who say, "Yeah, we still have a party line." Maybe, that, maybe that's wow. yeah. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. Well, in a sense, we all have Wi-Fi, so we have, do have a party line. That's true. Still. Yes. Yep. Uh, Bob's invention, his brilliant invention, was to figure out how to make create a simple solution that allowed multiple nodes to share one medium. It was initially coax, then it went to twisted pair. Although the, the topology for twisted pair was not the same T connection, just sort of tie in. Um, uh, but the concept was essentially a party line. Uh, the idea was that someone wanting to send data to someone else would listen on the connection until the shared coax was quiet. Then they would transmit their data. But it was entirely possible, especially on a busy shared network with many nodes, that multiple parties who were listening for a pause might start transmitting at the same time. Back when, when Ethernet used coax, such a collision would actually create a higher voltage swing on the coax because of two transmitters trying to do the same thing at the same time. That was readily detected by everyone on the line. So the parties who were responsible for that jam up would wait a random length of time. They would back off a random length of time before retrying to send, also listening to make sure that the line was still quiet. So the system was elegant, simple, and clever. And later, when twisted pair wiring was used, there was not that overvoltage event, so the transmitting parties would listen to the line while transmitting to see whether they were able to reliably receive the message they had sent. If not... That meant that someone else had collided with them, transmitting and interfering. So again, each party would back off a random interval and retry. So the point was, Ethernet has always been a shared medium technology. Um, when semi-intelligent Ethernet switches replaced simple repeater hubs, things got better for twisted pair. Since the semi-intelligent switches could dynamically learn the network topology by building a table of which Ethernet MAC addresses were connected to which of their ports. So now, with that technology, rather than simply sending anything incoming back out of all ports, the incoming data would automatically be routed out of only one port where the destination MAC address had previously been seen and was known to reside. So this hugely reduced packet collisions within large networks. And that's uh, the one problem with Ethernet. We see this also with the shared medium of the air, which we're all using now with Wi-Fi, is that if you think about it, and all kinds of academic research has been done about the, the shape of the curve of the collapse of Ethernet when too many people are trying to talk at once because there, there is what this system, what this elegant sim, 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 simple system lacks is a is a means of handling too many people that is it it basically collapses and that's you you mentioned token ring at the beginning that's the the approach that IBM took where a virtual token 
is 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 op- circulates in a ring the person holding the token has permission to speak when they're done they pass the token to the next station that's the way IBM did this uh, but they didn't win Bob's simple system which it sort of models the internet in in how it's you know you wouldn't think it works it's simple it's clever you mean I'm just gonna put this packet on the wire and I, and I, and I don't know how it's gonna get there but it is uh-huh that's right similarly you mean I just wait till nobody else is talking and then I can talk uh-huh yeah of course if everyone's trying to talk at once you have a problem okay so the point is that switching helped a lot so 802.11 AC also known as Wi-Fi 5 introduced this MIMO technology it was actually uh, defined and equipment was certified in two rounds over time with the that is 802.11 AC the second round only more recently in 2016 which added the higher bandwidth capabilities of multi-user MIMO the widest of the channel expansion to 160 megahertz channel bandwidth and additional 5 gigahertz channels it also doubled the number of spatial streams with four antennas versus three which were uh, in that first round uh, and I thought I had I thought I said somewhere here I don't see it where I, I where I explained that the way this MIMO technology worked was very cool the 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 um, access point initially had three antennas it would use varying phase of the of its transmitted signal uh, where the phases would depending upon the angle of the receiver to the antennas it would create null zones where the phases canceled and extra power zones where the phases summed and so the the access point would periodically poll the receivers saying how do you hear me now how do you hear me now how do you hear me now using different phases among the antennas the the receivers would send back a how loud that was and what that did was it allowed the access point to adaptively learn effectively where these receivers were assuming as which is often the case they are relatively fixed in 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 an environment and to then essentially do beam forming that is if it knew it was sending something back to a given receiver it would look in its table to see what it may have learned about the opt about the receivers self reported optimal phase of the antennas and then use that phase essentially to beam this signal to that receiver minimizing interference in where the phases were not uh, aligned and were out of phase so again not something you want to wire up in the backyard but once it's all on silicon it doesn't cost anybody anything so you know except some extra transmitters and and those are cheap now so that brings us to 802.11 AX, also known as Wi-Fi 6. 802.11 AX aims to quadruple a single access point's overall data exchange capacity, which will most, the, the benefit of which will most be heavily felt in heavily used multi-client environments. Because it's not like one client gets four times the throughput. No, it's that the system degrades far less quickly. As I said, you can imagine everybody talking at once. That's the that's the failure case of Ethernet because you end up just with constant collisions and everybody backing off and trying again and more people talking. So, so then individual gets 30% more performance out of an 802.11 AX than, uh, than 
Wi-Fi 5. So Wi-Fi 6 gives about a 30% boost. But when you've got a lot of clients of an access point, then you begin to see uh, an improvement. It also uses this so-called multi-user MIMO, which can be sort of thought of as spatial domain multiplexing. That is, it, it multiplexes the space around the access point it into, you know, by, by learning what individual users are doing to reduce inter-client interference. Um, and then to this notion of the spatial domain multiplexing, AX significantly enhances its what's known as frequency domain multiplexing with what's called MUOFDMA, multi-user orthogonal frequency division multiple access. It's a fancy way of saying that the entire available spectrum that the, that the access point has allocated to it is dynamically divided into a very much larger number of very much smaller individual subcarriers. And by very large number, I mean 2,048 individual subcarrier channels. So this much higher level of individual attention, so, 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 so this allows a much higher level of individual attention to be given to each, each client. Clients are essentially able to, to receive not only a, a signal, a radio signal aimed at them, which the access point learns, but uh, they're also able to receive their own allocation of subcarriers that will not will inherently not collide with other clients in the area. So so essentially it it's managed to take what would look like a huge shared medium and create both essentially physical beams and radio channels within that region in order to 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 divide that that monolithic space up into, uh, you know, like in, into the ability to serve individual clients. So this is the kind of thing which in like huge auditoriums and stadium settings, you, you would want tons of these access points spread around and expect to get much better performance, except you need to have the compatible client. Of course, the system works with down spec clients with no problem, but you don't get a lot of these features because they are negotiated between the access point and the client on the fly unless you've got matching Wi-Fi 6 compatible clients. Oh, and one other thing too, there's a significant power savings available for mobile clients thanks to something known as target wake time, TWT, where the access point and the client are, are able to negotiate silent periods, uh, wh which allow the client to shut things down and, and not worry. So, and then in a final piece of news, just last month, uh, the FCC delivered some very good news to the Wi-Fi industry overall by agreeing to open and make available a significant chunk of new bandwidth so-called unlicensed bandwidth in the six gigahertz band. This is an additional 1200 megahertz worth of Wi-Fi spectrum, which will add 14 80 megahertz channels and 760 megahertz channels. So we can expect to see further reduced interference, even lower latency, uh, gigabit speeds and higher capacity for simultaneously managing many more devices. Uh, and I, I forgot to mention that uh, one of the things that Wi-Fi 6 also does is it expects to dramatically cut client latency by 75%. And anybody who's ever tried to use satellite internet, I know that Elaine was had a satellite inter internet for a while where she was, it's just, it's really a pain. Latency is just a thrill killer uh, in, uh, in internet use. So uh, Wi-Fi 6 should improve that too. Um, and as I was getting ready to make the move myself to Wi-Fi 6, but since I don't yet uh, have many other Wi-Fi 6 client devices 
and sends last month's chunk of new unlicensed bandwidth means that there will be another generation of access points coming along. Uh, I think I may wait until the newer access points, which include the six gigahertz band, hit mm-hmm. the market. Yep. Uh, but I don't expect those devices soon, since it'll likely require some tooling up of new silicon uh, and some radio design from scratch. So anyway, depending upon your need for Wi-Fi 6 today, uh, you might choose rationally to wait uh, or just say, hey, I want those features now. Surprising number. And I think, Leo, you said you were going to jump to six. I have six now with my Orbi. Yeah, it was very, very expensive. And I guess it's better. Uh, The problem is, you know, so few Wi-Fi 6 devices. So the iPhone 11 is, so you have that. Um, The MacBook Air, the new MacBooks are not. Uh, my Dell XPS, the brand new one, the 2020 is. Actually, I have an iPhone 10. Do I have six? No. Or five? You have oh, five. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> and then I have a whole bunch of old iPads. Yeah. It's so. very, none of, yeah. I don't think even the newest iPad has Wi Fi 6. So it's silly to get it. It's it's a huge expense. And as you say, 6E is coming. So I would defer and, you know, until you, and then you'll have enough. It's really, I think 6E is really aimed at uh, IoT devices because it's such a high frequency. Yep, that it's not going to go through walls at all. Uh, right. So I think it's really intended more f- uh, to handle the vast number of IoT devices we now find in people's houses <laughs> than anything else. I know. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, pro- you know, what we're doing? We're getting a guy come out, going to put in Ethernet. <laughs> Bob Metcalf's brilliant invention in every I'm, single room. I'm totally with you, Leo. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I was thinking about that while I was reading this, and you know, it's. Uh, it's useful to have Wi-Fi where you need portability, but uh, my own my own network here, I'm 100. Well, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, uh, you, gotta be you really don't want any podcasters no. to be do, do, trying to do this with Wi-Fi. Because of that collision-based yep. system, yeah. Yep. Nothing uh, is better now, than Wi-Fi. I think six – did you know if – did you notice whether that collision detection is still in six? I got the feeling that they were trying to do stuff to avoid that. Well, they they really are. So so that 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 whole spectrum allocation oh, okay. technology. Oh, okay. That's the idea. Is we'll just be on different. Yes. Would be on different frequencies. And exactly. Then it won't matter. Of course, there aren't that many frequencies. Even though it says zero to eleven, there's really only three bands you can operate in, in those in those eleven frequencies or twelve frequencies. So, it's not like <laughs> it's not like we're just we got every all the spectrum everywhere. But it'll be nice to have more channels. Have six E. Yep. It'll be good. Yep. Um, good. Uh, re- you know, I love it when you do the explainers, to be honest with you. Uh, so I hope there's no security problems next week and we can find another topic. <laughs> Who knows to what I'll deep. come up with yeah, to talk about. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, Steve Gibson's at GRC.com. That's his website. That's where you'll find Spinrite, of course, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. Uh, recommended that on the radio show uh, on Sunday, actually. A guy had oh, a perfect cool. example of a drive that Spinrite could help. Um, you can also find lots of free stuff there, in, including Shields Up to test your router and all sorts of information and a lot of little, lot of little rabbit holes you can crawl down and find <laughs> out things about, including squirrel. There's a squirrel down that rabbit hole. And uh, vitamin D. You know, I just read another uh, study that said vitamin D seems to be str- a strong indicator in your uh, chances of surviving COVID. So, they keep coming out. Yeah, yeah, they're seeing real correlations between mm-hmm. vitamin D status and and how you do if you get infected. Yeah, yeah so I'm yep. I'm taking my five thousand international units every yep. morning. Uh, thanks should. to you, as I always have. Uh, anyway, it's all there. GRC.com, including by the way, this show in two unique formats. He has a sixty-four kilobit audio. We've got that too at Twit.tv. But he also has a sixteen kilobit audio. Sounds a little scratchy. But sounds like Alexander Graham Bell, but. <laughs> It's small, and that's its advantage. There's also another very small file format, text. Yeah, a, a very nice transcription. Elaine does those. And uh, those are both available at grc.com in the Security Now area. We have 64 kilobit audio. We have video as well if you want to watch. Uh, all of that's at twit.tv sn. It's on YouTube as well. A lot of people do that. You can listen on your favorite voice-activated de- device. Just say Echo or Google or whatever. Play Security Now podcast. You'll hear the latest episode. Um, we do the show uh, on Wednesdays, 1.30 Pacific. I'm sorry, Tuesdays. Tuesdays. Used to be Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. Tuesdays, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. So if you're 
around at that time, you can do, watch us do it live at twit.tv slash live. On-demand uh, downloads available at twit.tv slash sn. Best thing to do, subscribe. That way you'll get it the minute it's available, audio or video. Just find your favorite podcast application and sign up today. It'll cost you nothing, despite the word subscribe, which I think has always scared people off. Like you're paying for it, but you're not. Steve, thank you so much, sir. We'll see you uh, next week on Security Now. Righto. Hey, folks, I am Micah Sargent, co-host of Tech News Weekly right here on the Twit Network. Yes, Tech News Weekly is a show we do every week, Jason Howell and myself, where we talk to people who are making and a break in the tech news. That's right. It's journalists, it's inventors, it's app makers, it's everybody who's bringing the tech news in a given week. It's all the stuff you want to know about in bite-sized chunks in a fantastic package. So be sure to subscribe. It's twit.tv slash TNW. Security now.